In section 4.3, we're going to be discussing basic probability rules. And we'll start off with the multiplication rule, which just means if we have two events that are occurring, we could just multiply them by each other. Now, for dependent events, if we're doing the probability of A and B to occur, we're going to multiply them, but we have to consider the conditional that one already happened when we multiply them. And we could rewrite this in order to get our original conditional probability. Let's see how this differs from independent events. And so probability of A and B, since they're independent, uh, we know the conditional is equal to probability of A. So uh, we replace this in here. And that's going to simplify it just a little bit. And so the probability of A and B occurring is going to just be the multiplication of them. The probability that one occurs and then times the probability the other one occurred. So we're just going to multiply them, hence the multiplication rule. But for dependent, we have to consider that one already happened. The addition rule for probability of A or B, two events uh, happening here, uh, it's a probability of the addition of both of them minus any overlap that we have because we don't want to double count. For mutually exclusive, if you recall from the last section, uh, for mutually exclusive events, uh, we know that the probability of A and B is equal to zero. So if we replace zero in for here, this part just goes away. And so we get a reduced version of probability of A plus probability of B. Because there is no overlap, we don't have to subtract that portion there. And so let's try these in action here. And so you could go ahead and um, pause it uh, to give it a go. But let me first write this down here. I like to identify everything uh, that we have. So the probability that we have a math class is going to be 0.2. The probability that we have a speech class is 0.65. And then our conditional here, math given a speech, is 0.25. So I always like to identify what's in the problem before I get started. So go ahead and pause it here, give it a go, and then I'll work them out. Okay, so the probability of M and S is equal to the probability of M given S times the probability of S. So this is what we're trying to uh, show here. It wants us to find this, and we're just plugging uh, the values that we have into here, and we get 0.1625. So pretty straightforward. They gave us the formula. We're just plugging those in. For part uh, B here, once again, they're giving us the formula to use. And we're going to just try to plug everything in and identify. So we know probability of M that they have a math class is 0.2. Probability of S is 0.65. And then probability of M and S we just figured out right before. So that's 0.1625. And we're just plugging it in and getting our calculations. So 0.6875. For part C, we want to know if they're independent. So if these two equal to each other. And so we see that 0.25 is not equal to 0.2. So the conditional is not given to the probability of just uh, the math class. So this is not true. So these guys are not going to be uh, independent. They should be equal to one another. And then we want to show that they're mutually exclusive. That means that uh, M and S, the probability of that should equal to zero. And that was actually, we calculated from part A, and we see that that is not true as well. So M and S are not going to be mutually exclusive. In 4.4, we're going to use these rules of probability uh, in contingency tables. We'll work them out a little bit uh, heavy with the formulas, and then we'll try to do them a little bit intuitively without relying so much on the formulas. 
So here's a pro, uh, here's a chart. And when we actually collect data from a survey, when we organize it, a two-way table, what we call a contingency table, is going to be a nice way to organize all of that data. So this is very commonly used. And I like to identify everything here. So they've identified males and then uh, taken the hilly path. Uh, but I'm going to let F be females, L be the lake path, and W be the wooden path here, just so we have notation for everything. And let's go ahead and write down some probabilities to work out here. And again, if you like, you could pause it and, and give it a go before I get involved here. So the probability that they take the lake path is going to be uh, 71 out of 200. So the lake path here, our total for the lake path is going to be 71. And our grand total, we know is 200. So 71 out of 200 here. Now, what's the complement of that? Well, we don't have to count out all the other uh, groups here. We can, but we could use our idea of the complement uh, where it's 1 minus uh, P of L. So if we subtract those two, we're going to get the difference, which is 0.645. So this is one case where the formula ends up being a bit beneficial, gives us a bit of a shortcut. Let's look at the conditional probability you take the lake path given you're a female so p of l and f over p of f now that you uh, take the lake path and your female here is going to be the 45 right out of the 200 and then in our denominator the probability that you're a female here uh, is going to be the 110 out of the 200 And if we clean this up, a fraction just means division, and then we could do the reciprocal for multiplication. Uh, we could simplify those 200s, get a factor of 1, and we will end up with 45 uh, over 110 in this case. And notice this is a conditional one where we could reduce the sample space. So if we're saying the probability that you uh, take the lake path given that you were female well I'm giving you the fact that I'm looking at female so it's going to really reduce our sample space to this and so we really just have to consider the 45 out of the 110 probability of F and L and so we're going to use multiplication rule, probability of F times the probability of L given F. And so that's going to give us 110 out of 200 times 45 out of 110. Uh, we've already worked out this portion here in part 3. And then probability that you're a female is going to be the 110 out of the 200. And so that gives us our 0.225. Let's try one more here. Probability of L times probability of H given L. Now, H given L, these guys are going to be, uh, notice that we take the hill path or we take the lake path. These are mutually exclusive. We're assuming we're only going to take one hike we're only going to go through one path so they both can occur at the same time that's going to give us zero so that probability is just going to be zero probability of f or l and we're going to use our addition rules here and so probability of your female is the 110 probability that you take the lake path is going to be 71 and then we want to subtract that overlap that we have between them and so that's going to give us about 0.68 
Let's try another one of these L or H with our addition rules here. But this time around, we're going to see that L and H are mutually exclusive. So again, they cannot occur at the same time, L and H. So that overlap becomes zero. That's where this is coming from. And so that'll give us about 0 0.805 in this case here. Okay. Now we went a little heavy on the formulas here. Let's try another one of these contingency tables and we'll try to do it a bit more intuitively without relying on the formulas. So let's look at this example here. And so we're looking at genders, uh, male and female specifically, and uh, whether uh, they are right or left-handed here. And so let's try some of these probabilities again. But we're not going to get so heavy on the formula here. Okay. So first thing is I like to finish up my table and make sure I have the totals of everyone here. So add them up uh, vertically, horizontal, and then it's a good idea to double check them, add them up both ways, and we get 100 in this case. So we want the probability that we are female. And so female, what we're going to look at is the total females that we have is 48 out of the 100. Let's look at probability of F and R here. So here we're just looking for an overlap uh, between these. And so uh, the overlap is going to be that you're female and right-handed. So I'm looking at females and I'm looking at right-handed. That's going to be my overlap there. So that 44, again, out of the grand total. For this next one, let's look at an OR here. So F or R. So all we want is one of them to occur here. Uh, so F is going to be that they're female, so we're looking at this group here. And then OR, the right-handed, and we're looking at this group right here. So what we could do is if we add up all the females, which is 48... And we add up all of the right handed, which is 87. But notice there's an overlap portion there of the 44, which we could subtract there. So we're just trying to match them up, but get rid of any of that overlap this time. Because we don't want to count those 44 in both groups. You either count them in the females or you count them in the right handed. So that's where we're getting the 91 out of 100, which will give us our decimal approximation. Again, still got to do a little bit of addition and subtraction here, but not really relying on that formula. So we've got a conditional. And so the probability of F given uh, R here, so that you're female, given that you're right-handed. So when you have a conditional, this is where we reduce the sample space. I'm giving you the fact that we are right-handed. So my whole sample space gets reduced to this. So this is now going to become my new denominator. Now from these, how many are female? Well, there's 44 that are female. So we reduce our sample space to just this category of the condition of what's given there. And we're getting those 44 out of that 87. Again, without heavily relying on that formula there, we could do it a bit more intuitively. And then, of course, the complement that you're not female. And so we know there's 100 total, and we know there's 48 females. So the difference is 52. And we could actually see this from the table. We don't even really need to do that subtraction. Uh, we just get the 52 out of the 100.